We're, hey, we're glad you're here, and, and uh, we're excited to have uh, Dennis Gaxioli and his wife Lorna is with us uh, this weekend. I don't know if you've seen some of our, some of our uh, social media posts. Dennis is uh, uh, a dry bar comedy, clean comedy comedian. Uh, the, his dry bar comedy has over 150 million views. Uh, so, a lot of, so a lot of people have seen him. He's an uh, Air Force veteran and, and a pastor's son. And so the reason, listen, the reason why we brought him is this, is that not only is he funny, but he has an anointing of God on his life. And so um, we're excited to have him come. He's going to be with us tomorrow in both services as well. And so I want you just to give a hand to Dennis Gaxiola as he comes. Thank you, Pastor. How's everybody doing? It's, it's an honor to be here. Okay, I, he said I had to wear this, at least so you guys could see they, they gave me a lay, but okay, um, so I don't sneeze during my performance. <laughs> it's beautiful, but it was itching me, and I'm like, okay, I can feel it. I can feel it. <laughs> Thank you um, to the pastors, because um, the hospitality has been amazing. We came in Thursday, and they've, uh, they've treated us with a lot of uh, aloha, and it, it's just good to be here. My wife is from Oahu, so when, the, when, when we booked this, she was like, oh, yeah, she has to come. I love beautiful people here. I love it. A um, little bit about myself. I recently turned 40. Thank you, 10 years ago. And... Uh, <laughs> I wrote that joke eight years ago. <laughs> Over 40, wave a hand. Don't pull a muscle. Over 40. Okay. Less than 40 is going to think this is... Did you raise your hand, bro? Row three? Did, did you raise your hand? No, you look good, but if you're not 40 yet, I want to hear your testimony because... He survived something, man. Um, less than 40 is going to think this is a joke. Over 40 knows I'm telling the truth. Our bodies change. We go through things that we didn't experience in our 20s and our 30s. A couple weeks ago, I got hurt sleeping. <laughs> Not jumping out of bed while I slept. I pulled the muscle. <laughs> I'm limping around my house. I don't know why I'm sore. If in your 20s or your 30s, you wake up sore, you know why. You had a high school reunion football game or you helped your cousin move. Over 40, we wake up, slow, or we wake up sore and it's a mystery. <laughs> I limped around all day till my wife reminded me. She said, you got that cramp last night. Who gets the cramp in the calf in the middle of the night? <laughs> When she told me about the cramp, I, was, I remembered I had a flashback to what I was dreaming. Because I, I, dr I was dreaming that my car, the blinkers went out, and I used my left foot to signal that I was turning right. Because that's how my foot was with that cramp. <laughs> I limped around all day till it was time for me to take my nap. I was scared. I was like, I'm not in good enough shape to sleep. <laughs> when do we get that old where sleep is a worry, you know? <laughs> You're not laughing, bro. <laughs> it's coming. How old are you? 31. Oh, you got nine good years left, bro. And he's 41? Oh, okay. You, look, you still look good. You're holding on, but just... You're at the top of the roller coaster. <laughs> You're right there. It's coming pretty soon. <laughs> Mentioned my wife. i uh, been married 27 years. Thank you. Uh, three wives, but 27 years. Uh, I'm good at it, man. <laughs> Someone else has relationship problems in the back. Okay. <laughs> no, wife number three is wife number one. We got married as kids, divorced as kids, and look at God. 23 years later, we got back together. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, that's, you can give the Lord a round of applause on that. Yeah. And I'm old school. Where are the men that actually drop to a knee when they propose? Where are the men? There's a few real men left. Pastor, you didn't drop to a knee? <sighs> Dack him up. Just say yes for, for the congregation. <laughs> we'll have an altar call in a little while, bro. <laughs> no, I dropped to a knee when I proposed, and I looked up and said, would you marry me? And she looked into my eyes and said, why do you want to marry me again? And I looked deeper into her eyes and said, because I miss half my stuff. <laughs> they gave her my baseball cards. She don't even like baseball. I was like, really, Judge? <laughs> we have two anniversaries now. All the men feel my pain on that. Here's a tip, ladies. If you want a good anniversary, remind your husband. A week out, go, hey, what are we doing next week? And then he'll, you'll have a great anniversary. Don't remind him the day after. You forgot, because you forgot too, okay? <laughs> we have two, and she wants to celebrate both of them. <laughs> Pastor, you know there's, a, there's an anniversary gift chart? There, there's an anniversary. Most men know the big ones, 25, silver, 50th. Is that my wife? <laughs> 50th is golden, but they have a chart to list every year, a, a gift for every year. First year is paper, 50th is golden. They got it wrong from the get-go. First year should be golden. You still like each other. <laughs> you haven't gotten on each other's nerve yet. 50th should be paper. You make it that long, you just write a note. We made it. <laughs> No man wrote that gift chart. That was not written by a man. If it was a man, it was an old school Mormon. Back in the day when they had multiple wives, they needed a gift chart. <laughs> the wives are getting jealous. How come she got a better gift while well, she's been here longer, Sarah? Okay. <laughs> I got a Mormon mad at me the other day. I was, I was on the Huckabee show and I did that joke and uh, I got a nasty email. The lady took the time to look up my email and let me know that I had disrespected uh, her religion. She literally said, my religion, not her faith, not her relationship, her religion. And I was like, well, don't knock on my door anymore. <laughs> 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 the little one got that joke. <laughs> so we came to Hawaii and um, we did what was required. We went to Zippy's. <laughs> Pastor's like, hey, the steakhouse, hey, this place. I was like, Zippy's. <laughs> it's hard to find somewhere where they serve rice, chili beans, and chicken. <laughs> So we've been back together uh, five years. That's wool on the gift chart. <laughs> if we never divorce, we've been married 37 years. That's not just China, that's bone China. That's that fancy China. <laughs> I can afford wool, I don't know about China. So I compromised. Compromise is the key to any relationship. I compromised. I got her a wool sweater made in China. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies, we get it. You're smarter than us. Clap if you agree, man. Clap, Pastor, please. <laughs> Bro, you didn't clap. I'm trying to help you right now, okay? No, ladies have instincts that we don't have, okay? So all we ask ladies is let us win one argument a year. How many men would be happy to win one a year? You know? 
And don't let us win when you know we're wrong. Don't, you know, don't let us be right when you know we're wrong. We're turning left, you know we should go right. And you're like, go ahead, Columbus. <laughs> <laughs> I like you, bro. You're going back to California. I'm taking you to all my shows. <laughs> I almost got shot for not listening to my wife. Not by her, you know. <laughs> She's Puerto Rican, you know. She, she would have cut me, you know. <laughs> I was doing prison ministry in California, and in the prisons in California, the two rules are your colors. You can't wear certain colors because of gangs. And above all, you cannot wear blue jeans. All inmates wear blue jeans in California prisons. I'm getting dressed early in the morning, barely any light in the room, and my wife looks at me and says, why are you wearing blue jeans? I said, they're black. She said, they're blue. I said, they're black. She said, go ahead. <laughs> I show up at the prison, and the correctional officer looks me up and down and says, can I help you? I said, yes, ma'am. I'm here for the morning chapel. I'm the comedian, and I'm going to speak to the inmate. She said, oh, not today. You're wearing blue jeans. And in that light, I could see I had blue jeans on. This prison is five minutes from Costco. I got 30 minutes to go to Costco, buy a pair of black pants, change, come back to the prison, and process in. The parking lot is like four blocks away. I've got 30 minutes, so I take off running. Yeah, by the way, if you're leaving the prison and you're wearing blue jeans, <laughs> do not run. And that's what I heard from the guard tower, do not run. I assumed he was talking to somebody on the other side of the fence. You know, why is he yelling at me? So I kept running. And the next thing I heard was, if you continue to run, we will be forced to shoot. And that'll stop anybody. So I stopped, I looked up and said, me? He goes, yes, you, in the blue jeans. You should listen to your wife. <laughs> it's a good guard tower. <laughs> I did Folsom Prison. I don't know if you know, familiar with Folsom Prison. That's a high security prison in California. That's where Johnny Cash shot his, uh, recorded his famous album right there in Folsom Prison. And uh, I got, I went in, that was the first maximum security prison I went into. And it was a blessing to be able to go in. And I knew I had a lot of people praying for me and prison fellowship. They had a bunch of people with me and they told me, treat the inmates with respect. They'll respect you. So I'm going in with confidence, a lot of people praying and Right when we signed in, 100% power outage in the full prison. They said, you can go in, the power should come on. So we had to go through two bays of cells to get to the yard, to walk all the way across the yard to the chapel. We go through the first bay, it's three tiers of cells, two men in each cell. And I'm walking in there like George Jefferson from the Jeffersons. I'm walking in with confidence. <laughs> Hang in there, brother. Stay strong, brother. You know, I was like that because they were all locked up. I was safe. <laughs> we get to the next bay. They hadn't secured the men yet. I went from George Jefferson to an 1800 Catholic monk. I was like, oh, the blood of... <laughs> We got, they came to us uh, um, after about an hour in the chapel. They said, it's getting dark. The power hasn't come on. We need to get you out of here because we can't protect you once it gets dark. So I was like, wow. So they escorted us out. And we went by the cafeteria. And it's where Johnny Cash did his album. I said, how come we can't be in there? It's huge. The chapel could seat 100. The cafeteria could seat 400. I'm like, why can't we be in there? And they said, well, you have to have special permission. And they called back, uh, they said, you know, if you can come back on a Saturday afternoon, we'll let you into the chapel, uh, into the uh, cafeteria. And it was beautiful because the fence that separates the cafeteria, it's all indoors, but the, they have a fence in case a riot breaks out. They have to be able to lock everything down. But uh, it's right next to the family visiting room. And I was like, man, if we're in there, men will come in 
from visiting their families. They're going to be broken because they just got to see their family. And sure enough, they, they would come in and leave the families and come right into the service. And it was amazing. There was men that gave their hearts to the Lord that day. And I didn't get stabbed. So I made it out. <laughs> Get back to the jokes. <laughs> so this is good to be back live because we, uh, you know, did they lock you guys down over here? Yeah, for the pandemic, we got locked down in California. And I, I'll never forget when the pandemic hit. Young people, nobody in here has been through a pandemic before, okay? My kids were asking, what, what's going to happen, Dad? I was like, I don't know. I wasn't alive in 1912, okay? <laughs> However long ago the pandemic was. Nobody here experienced it either. We went through things that nobody will experience again. I'll never forget when the pandemic hit, it was right before Easter, and our pastor sent out an email, church is locked down, we're doing Easter online, and for communion, use whatever you have at home. Everybody was afraid to go to the store, so just nobody had anything for communion. So he said, use whatever you have at home. I don't think I'll ever take communion from a NyQuil shot glass <laughs> with prune juice and a flaming hot Cheeto for the body. <laughs> it too far, she left right there. She got up. She, Sister, you can't leave. That's 10% of the crowd. Where are you going? <laughs> we are on lockdown, all right? Where are you going? <laughs> I have ADD, so when people get up, I got a squirrel. <laughs> um, we had, do you guys have to wear the mask out here? Yeah, they, make, they made us wear the mask. And they're talking in California because they're so crazy. They're making us, they're talking about, even though the pandemic's almost over, they're talking about people wearing the mask again. Ladies, if they do that out here, do us men a favor. If you're going to put a mask on, put your eyebrows on. Okay. <laughs> Early in the morning, you're going to Foodland and you got your mask on with no eyebrows. It's scary, okay? <laughs> you look like a Muslim ninja. It's freaking every. <laughs> it's, fr <laughs> it's freaking everybody out, all right? So. <laughs> I remember the first year of the pandemic, the week before Christmas, my son lost a tooth. And he said, Dad, will Santa and the tooth fairy show up the same week? I said, son, you're 27. <laughs> Start flossing and stop calling me, okay? <laughs> I love the beautiful mix of people here. That's what heaven's going to look like. I go to a multicultural church in California, and I always tell people that if you're not comfortable in a multicultural church, don't worry about heaven. <laughs> you're not going. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not comfortable worshiping with all your brothers and sisters, how are you going to be comfortable around the throne of God? We're all going to be there. All his children will be there, you know? Speaking Spanish, it's going to be beautiful. <laughs> Come on, he named his son Jesus. That one's in the book, okay? <laughs> he didn't name him Jeffrey. He didn't name him Jamil. He named him Jesus. <laughs> There's a lot of Mexicans in the Bible. They don't teach this on Sunday. <laughs> you got some people looking through their concordance. I don't, I don't see this in my Bible. <laughs> No, you got to read between the lines. Moses was very Mexican. Who else to get a bunch of people across the water to the promised land? That's my people. <laughs> We're not illegal. We are traditionalists. <laughs> We've been doing this for thousands of years, okay? <laughs> King David, Mexican. We got security coming in. Am I in danger? Did I cross the line? <laughs> so these guys, they got all bright vests on. I was like, man, the fire department's here. <laughs> Welcome back. 
Did I have to start over? Did you hear everything? <laughs> King David, very Mexican. Only a five foot Mexican could look at a nine foot giant and go, I could take him. <laughs> <laughs> Abraham, Mexican. He was 100 when his wife got pregnant. Come on, somebody. That's, that's <laughs> it's in the Bible, sister. I didn't make that up, okay? Some people think Noah was Mexican. Noah was not Mexican. <laughs> Taking care of animals and giving them the love and nutrition that they deserve. That's a gift the Lord gave to our white brothers and sisters. <laughs> <laughs> Pastors were telling us they had a chicken in their backyard. <laughs> they caught it and took it downtown to a park to be with other chickens. I sat there and kept a straight face. I was like, that is the whitest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> that had been a Filipino family. We were like, oh, adobo tonight. <laughs> a bit of Hawaiian family. Oh, we're going to raise him to fight. <laughs> Not you guys, you rescued the wild chicken. <laughs> if Noah had been Mexican, that story would have ended tragically different. The flood is over, the ark opens up, and Noah steps off with some leather boots. <laughs> God is like, Noah, where are the cows? <laughs> Would you like a taco? <laughs> <laughs> the la last time I got to uh, come to Hawaii for comedy and, and ministry, uh, I was at a church and they had a lot of Micronesians. You guys have any Micronesians here? You are not a Micronesian. <laughs> are you Micronesian? No. I, I learned how to speak Micronesian. You know how to say hi to a Micronesian? You give them a microwave. was a cool church but all the Micronesians sat up front and they had like your last bro went higher and so it was I felt like I was at the chocolate factory you know and they were all the little Oompa Loompas laughing <laughs> you're beautiful people I felt so tall <laughs> if I don't make fun of you um, don't feel bad, okay? I try to make fun of everybody because I'm an equal opportunity, you know. <laughs> Everybody's so politically correct nowadays. It's hard to laugh, but God knew what he was doing when he made us all with unique characteristics. Yeah. You know, if we say we're all the same, we are all equal, but we all have unique things in our culture, you know, and it, it's what makes... That's what makes the world beautiful and what makes America beautiful and especially Hawaii, because Hawaii, you guys blend everybody, you know, and it's beautiful. Amen? Yeah. Um, I, got, I got a mix of a family. I got, uh, like, my sister, uh, my younger sister, she married a Jewish man, and my, my nephew's at the age where he wants to get a car, but he's not sure if he should steal it or buy it wholesale. <laughs> Brother crossed his arms on that one. Sorry, bro. <laughs> he crossed his arms like, no shalom for you. <laughs> I have kids at home. Who still has kids at home? Okay. Um, 
Well, first, first of all, my wife is happy because we, you know, we got remarried and I had kids from uh, family number two. And so she's like, okay, the, it, was, it was smart because if you have a blended family, my wife said two things for me when we got remarried. I need some of your time. And she said, I'm not a stepmom, I'm a mom. And I said, go for it, beat them. Yeah. <laughs> she don't beat them. <laughs> No, I, and, and she, she's like, you know, if I'm going to be the wife and mother of this house, I'm not a stepmom. Because it, it, you, if, you, if you add labels, now it makes the kids think, well, she's, she's not in charge. I told all my three, my three younger kids, she's in charge. Because I'm always gone. I'm traveling. She's in charge. And believe me, you do not want to make her mad. I scared them. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, it, it's been beautiful. But I, have, I still have two at home. Um, my wife, and by the way, my wife, uh, she puts up with me, okay? I, I do jokes about her, but she's the smartest person I know, okay? She's, she's, smarter, she's way smarter than me, and she doesn't do it on purpose, but just sometimes she makes me feel like I should have paid attention in school. <laughs> you know. Her and her sister, they, they have special words. They, they, their number one thing is Scrabble. My wife is Scrabble smart. She got words I don't know, and she uses them on me. <laughs> you do that to him? <laughs> oh, okay. I, was, I, I, I had dinner with you guys last night, and I was like, I was like he's the smart one. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> if you're waiting for the good jokes, these are them, sister. She hasn't laughed yet. I'm just... There's a spirit of slowness on this side of the room. We're going <laughs> to. <laughs> My wife is married to a comedian and she does not laugh out loud. There's no sound. She can smile and that's her laughter. And if she does laugh, it's, you see her, her shoulder shaking, but she will not laugh out loud. But one day, we're in bed early in the morning having coffee and she's doing her Bible study and she has a Christian book and she busts out laughing. And I'm, I'm like, really? You don't laugh at any of my jokes, but you're laughing during a Bible study. I said, what's so funny? I took it personal and she's laughing at this book and not at me. I said, what's so funny? She goes, the book, it has a typo. And instead of saying the scripture, get behind me, Satan, the book said, get behind me, Stan. <laughs> <laughs> we're watching the queen's funeral this is a scrabble word she pulled on me we're watching the queen's funeral we got up at five in the morning to watch the queen's funeral and the guards are we okay that sounds like noah that this is about <laughs> that's just regular rain right there right we're not I'm holding an electrical thing, and if lightning, you know. <laughs> Bro, if I fall, that's not part of my act, okay? <laughs> We're watching the Queen's funeral, and they have the, the guards, you know, in their beautiful uniforms. And my wife says, this is 5 in the morning. Coffee hasn't kicked in. And she goes, their uniforms are so ornate. You know what ornate means? I know no one over here uses ornate, okay? <laughs> I had to look it up so I didn't feel dumb. I'm oh, decorative. I was like, you know, yes, they are very ornate. <laughs> we were traveling. I was traveling alone, and I needed our password to sign in to, uh, to, for the Wi-Fi. Um, I had to, I had to connect to our home cable system. It was weird. And I needed our password. So she gives me the password and in the middle of our password, there is the and sign, but she doesn't say and sign. Who said ampersand? Like four people know that I didn't know that, <laughs> but I didn't want to let her, let her know that I didn't know. So I get off the phone and I put in the letters and numbers and then I spell ampersand with the rest of the numbers and it wouldn't work. So then I look up ampersand and I'm like, oh, it's the and sign. 
because I was calling her babe. The password's not working. She goes, you have to put ampersand. And I'm like, I spelled it right. It's not working. She goes, what do you mean you spelled it? <laughs> it's just the and sign. <laughs> She's a wonderful, wonderful wife, and she puts up with me and my kids. I have, I have one that might not make it. No, he's healthy, but he's on my last nerve, okay? <laughs> Anybody deal with teenagers that get on the last, the very last nerve? He thinks he's smarter than me, and the fact that he's smarter than me doesn't bother me. The fact that he acts like I don't know that he's smarter than me. I feel like I'm getting punked in my own house all the time, you know? <laughs> last year, this, this is an example. He... he he come to my room early December, I'm sitting at my computer and he comes to my room and he fakes being humble. <laughs> How do you fake being humble? <laughs> he put his head down with a little piece of paper in his hand. He goes, dad, this is all I want for Christmas. I know who I'm dealing with. And I take that little piece of paper and I was like, get behind me, Stan. <laughs> I take that little piece of paper, when I unfold it, it's a full sheet of paper. The boy listed 10 video games. Those are 70 bucks a piece now. I reached over and I got his report card and I folded it as small as I could and said, you should try to read this. The boy had a D in English. That's the only language he speaks. How did you almost flunk talking? <laughs> Five boys, one girl, my daughter's still home. Um, she's, she's a junior in college. She just got accepted to UH. So she'll be, she'll be coming to UH, transferring to UH next year uh, for the spring semester. But um, I did everything I could to protect her through high school because her dream was to become a family therapist to help children that are raised by parents like me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she, was, she did everything she needed to get scholarships. She was the commander of the ROTC, captain of the girls wrestling team, varsity cheerleader as a sophomore. Not at a little school that needed anybody. No, it was a large school. She beat out juniors and seniors to make varsity. And the boys start coming around when she made cheerleader. And I didn't know how to handle it. What's the right age that a young lady date, Pastor? 35. That's a man of wisdom you guys have. <laughs> My man in the back. What's the right age that a young lady date? He's quiet now, okay. <laughs> I told her 33. I said, Jesus never went on a date. You outlived the Lord. <laughs> you could go on a date. But she left to college, and then when the pandemic hit, she came home because the school was closed down. And one of her high school friends has been upgraded to boyfriend. And what's freaking me out is I like him. <laughs> My only problem is I can't remember his name. <laughs> He's got the most hardcore Latino name I've ever heard. His parents are from Peru, and the only way I remember this Peruvian young man's name is to think of a Japanese tourist <laughs> saying hello in English. <laughs> Hiro. <laughs> The boy's name is Jairo, J-A-I-R-O. So every time he comes to my house, that's how I remember, Japanese tourist, Jairo. <laughs> my daughter thinks that joke is racist. She said, Dad, that's racist. Every time you say Jairo, I said, you just did it too. You <laughs> Are we okay? Are we going to float away? <laughs> I just feel like doing the Gilligan theme right now. Just sit right back and we'll hear. <laughs> oh, he came to my house. He's romantic. He showed up at my house with flowers. I went to the door. I said, Hi, Ro, what are you doing? 
He said, I brought her flowers. I said, I can see that. Now I need to go buy my wife flowers. <laughs> I didn't let him in the house. I said, goodbye. Hi, Ro. <laughs> <laughs> my daughter always says, you're going to get canceled, Dad. I said, by who? I didn't subscribe. <laughs> Uh, young people, stop labeling everything that you disagree with. Stop labeling it racist, okay? There's enough real racism. You don't need to label everything racist, okay? By today's standards, I got called an ethnic slur every day from junior high through high school. Back then, it was funny. Today, if it happened, CNN would fly in a reporter, and they would start a GoFundMe, and, you know. <laughs> We're here with little Jose. I'm, like, I'm, I'm Dennis. Shh. Jose was hurt by words. <laughs> you okay, sister? This is all I got. I got jokes, okay? She's, she's holding her face. She's like, oh, my God. I went to Bible school for, I went to Bible school for uh, five years, and I'm still two years away from my associate's degree. <laughs> I wish that was a joke. Um, <laughs> no, five, five years of college, and this is all I got. Jokes. <laughs> you see some ministers on TV, maybe even here at the house, they're so anointed when they pray for people, the people fall out. I didn't get that one. <laughs> I got jokes. <laughs> And I understand why with the sense of humor the Lord gave me, if he put that kind of anointing on me, I would abuse it. <laughs> Go to the movies and there's a big head person in front of me. I'd be like, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> so I can see now. <laughs> you needed that at the concert. <laughs> I go to the post office during the holidays and there's a long line. I'd be like, oh, we're about to have revival up in here. <laughs> okay, what was I talking about before she stopped breathing? I got nervous because she was, she was doing that. What was I talking about? Okay. High row. Oh, getting called an ethnic slur every day. So every day from junior high through high school, my brother and I would walk to school and we would pass our friends out, Kenny Washington. Kenny happened to be African-American. When Kenny would see us, he would join us walking to school. But before he joined us, he would call me taco and my brother sauce. <laughs> that joke never got old to Kenny. What's up, taco? What's up, sauce? Taco sauce. <laughs> I didn't get offended. I didn't need a safe space or a comfort dog. <laughs> I just thought about it. Tacos are delicious. Who told Kenny? <laughs> I joined the Air Force in 1985. A few years later, I became a supervisor. And believe it or not, the young man I supervised came from a small town in Tennessee. I was the first Mexican he ever met and he admitted to me he had never had Mexican food. Sounds crazy, especially in California. He's stationed in California. He tells me he never had Mexican food. My Latino pride came out. Everybody should be proud of their culture. That's what makes America great when we share our cultures. So when he told me he had never had Mexican food, I said, you're going to a taqueria today. And then when you're on the West Coast, if you go to a taqueria and they got fancy menus, don't eat there. You got to go to a taqueria where the menu is written on a wall. <laughs> That's a good taqueria. So we're driving to lunch and I'm bragging to Jeff. We're, it's, we're, we're a deep, beautiful, diverse culture. And we get to the taqueria. He looks at the menu. He goes, what's a taco? I was like, are you serious? You never even had a taco? He goes, I never had any of this. I called CPS. I reported his parents. <laughs> this boy is neglected. <laughs> but I explained to him, a taco is a tortilla filled with meat, with cheese, with lettuce, with salsa. That's a taco. He goes, wow, what's an enchilada? I said, oh, that's way different. That's a tortilla filled with meat and cheese and 
The sauce is on the outside. <laughs> What's a burrito? I said, oh, that's way different. <laughs> it's a big tortilla filled with meat and cheese. And <laughs> we got all the way down to fajitas. I said, oh, I said, do it yourself, kid. <laughs> I get my political views from my grandfather, very wise old man from Torreon, Mexico. I went up to my grandpa one day, said, Grandpa, what do you think about a woman's right to choose? He said, mijo, everyone should wear shoes. <laughs> I saw the look on pastor's face. He's like. <laughs> I love seeing the kids, a lot of young people. That means the house is healthy. Amen. I go to churches that have no young people, no children. I'm like, oh, this is a funeral home. <laughs> they just have funerals for the elders and then eventually the church dies. When you got children in the church, don't worry when they cry. That means the church is healthy, yeah. amen? Yeah. We got a future. <laughs> we have grandkids now. We have six kids, seven kids total, because we have the his and hers. We have our kids that, from when we were married, and then we have the his and hers, we, and so it's seven total. Six boys, one girl. Um, or as she says, you have six, I have three. So, but, um, but then we have six grandchildren now. The oldest and the youngest are the girls, and the four in the middle, they're our grandsons. And I'm going to keep it real with you. Grandsons, because all my grandsons come from my sons. Grandsons, who has grandchildren? Where the grandparents are? Who has grandchildren with son, uh, that have uh, from a son? Grandchildren from a son. Okay. See, they'll never admit this in public, but grandchildren from a son go a little higher in the Christmas wish list than everybody else. <laughs> They're heirs to the throne. They got the family name. Now, my four grandchildren, I, I'm, I'm blessed to be on the two largest comedy tours that have included Latino comics. The Latin Kings of Comedy Tour. I'm on the 20th anniversary tour with some celebrity comedians. I'm, I'm not only on it, I'm producing it. So I, the Lord doubled down the blessing because I get paid for producing and for being on it. But then I'm on the Fluffy Tour with Gabriel Iglesias when he wants a clean comedian. Gabriel, I've known Gabriel since he started out, so he uses me when he wants a clean comedian. And I travel the country in, not only to churches, but to arenas and theaters full of Latinos. And I come home and I can't wait to see my four grandsons and their little beautiful freckle-faced, blue-eyed white boys. <laughs> <laughs> their color's not important. They could be purple and I would love them just as much. My only issue is I can't take my own grandsons to the mall without an Amber Alert going off. <laughs> I'm at the mall with my grandsons and I hear my phone beep, middle-aged beaner with four of our precious ones. <laughs> That's you, Papa. <laughs> and my daughter-in-law is a, a beautiful Irish-Italian young lady and a, the two oldest grandsons, they're from, they're from her, my son, and uh, they don't believe in spankings. My son said, well, they're white, they don't believe in spankings. And I said, no, I have white friends that got beat, okay? I said, she's the baby of their family. They have two daughters, and their father is the nicest man you will ever meet. I don't think he's ever killed a fly, much less spanked his daughters. So in that family, they don't believe in spankings. Six kids, not one ever threw a tantrum. I always taught my kids self-respect, self-control, and uh, respect your elders. So you see kids that, you know, I get it, there's kids with autism and stuff like that, but a kid that's throwing a fit at a store because he didn't let them get a candy bar, whack them, you know, that's all you gotta do. <laughs> with love so that they learn in life there's a yes and there's a no, you know? <laughs> okay, so I'm not gonna do the marriage conference here. <laughs> but, <laughs> but my son and daughter-in-law are over the house and my oldest grandson is on the floor of the kitchen throwing a tantrum. 
because he can't have a cookie before dinner. So I look at my son and said, you need to handle this. He goes, they don't believe in spankings, dad. And I said, well, we do handle it. <laughs> We're doing it different. A Couple days later, my son and daughter-in-law go away for the weekend and they leave the boys with us. <laughs> My grandson is playing with a little fire truck on the coffee table, wooden coffee table, and he's playing. And his grandma, my wife, looks at him and says, Nico, put that toy on the floor. You're going to scratch the table. And my grandson looked right at his grandmother and went, yes, defiant. So I lean forward. I'm sitting right on the couch. I lean forward, and I take the toy. I said, now you have nothing. God bless Nico. Uh, he didn't only swing, he hit me. I could have blocked it, but I was shocked that his hand went up. I was like, five sons, none of them ever tried to hit me. My grandson, he hit me. What do you think I did? I didn't have to process it. I snatched him up, whacked him on the rear, put him in the corner. Ten minutes later, he's sitting right next to me. I'm sorry, Papa. I said, I bet you are. Um, A little while later, I hear my son at the door. I ran to the door because, you know, whoever snitches first, that's the one that gets away with it. And I couldn't <laughs> let my, my grandson beat me to the door. So I said, son, your son hit me. Please tell your wife what happened next. He goes, oh, Nico got a whooping. And my daughter-in-law freaked out. You hit my son? I said, yes, you say one more word, you're next. <laughs> She's from the hood, she would have whooped me, so, you know, just. <laughs> yep, my, my grandsons are named Nico, Nolan, Sebastian, and Ace. Nico, Nolan, Sebastian, and Ace. I am the grandson on my mom's side, my grandfather was Sixto Sanchez. And on my dad's side, my grandfather was Fulgencio Giajola. We went from Sixto and Fulgencio to Nico, Nolan, Sebastian, and Ace. <laughs> we went from vine ripen to store-bought salsa in three generations. <laughs> Grandsons are a blessing. Grandchildren are a blessing. My granddaughters are, there's, you know, they're the princesses. You know, my daughter, they, they give me a hard time. They say, you, you spoil your daughter. And I'm like, yeah, I have one. And my granddaughters, are, so I have, I have four women in my life that count. You know, I have my wife, my daughter, and my two granddaughters. So those are the ones that God has blessed me with to protect. My grandsons, I got to raise them to be men so that they take care of theirs and get off my payroll, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so Eli is the 19 year old now he's, uh, he's the one with the bad grades and, uh, he, I feel, he thinks he has more street cred than me I grew up in Berkeley and Oakland, California I'm a Desert Storm combat veteran I've been shot at not in Desert Storm in, in Oakland I've been shot at <laughs> <laughs> Any veterans here tonight? Where are my military veterans? We go, oh, we got plenty. Okay, we're going to do a room check. Okay, um, Army. I was in the Air Force. We're going to do the whole room check. Army, give it up for the Army. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> salvation Army. Anybody ring a bell in December? <laughs> Anybody? No, no Salvation Army. <laughs> my man in the back raised his hand. He's like, yeah, that's me. <laughs> Navy, where are the Navy veterans at? Give the Navy a round of applause. <laughs> Old Navy, anybody wear Old Navy? Any? <laughs> I gotta cover all the branches. Uh, I always forget, the Coast Guard, where's the Coast Guard at? Thank you, give it up for the Coast Guard. <laughs> Marine Corps, where are the Marines? Any, where? I, I, don't, I don't mess with the Marines. Watch. Once a Marine, 
See, they don't know when the war ends. I leave them alone. <laughs> and Air Force, who's in the Air Force with me? Get okay, right here, right here. We were this close to being in the military, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you don't realize how tough you aren't <laughs> till you get out of the Air Force and you go to the VA with all the other veterans. I never forget when I went to take my physical. I see a Marine limp by. He goes, Vietnam took a bullet. I see an Army soldier limp by. He goes, Gulf War, shrap metal. I'm standing there with the wrist brace. <laughs> but I still want to act tough. I was like, U.S. Air Force, carpal tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> Email, 05. So who, we, got, we got a lot, married couples wave their hands. Married couples, okay. Who's, anybody got over 40 years of marriage? How many years? You guys are at 45 right now. 46, they were telling us last night, we, we were blessed to have dinner with them and they were saying, anybody beat 46? So I, I did the North Dakota State Fair because my career's on fire. <laughs> <laughs> It was a blessing because I got booked for the whole run of the fair, 36 shows in nine days. So I could work with families, and it was an outdoor, you know, it was a little amphitheater. And I found out two things about North Dakota. First of all, they have two types of people, cowboys and Indians. I was Indian for nine days. <laughs> and they stayed married up there forever. Every show had at least four or five couples with 50 years of marriage, and the record was 63. And that couple came to four of my shows. And they could hear the same jokes, you know, they didn't remember them, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> they sat up front every show. And the fourth time they came, I had to ask, I said, sir, how'd you make it last 63 years? Said, we haven't spoke since Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies, how many of you believe that old myth that men don't communicate? Wave a hand if you believe that men don't communicate. Right up front, I'm not going to say who, but it rhymes with pastor's wife. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to end that myth tonight. Ladies, we communicate. Just not with you. <laughs> And it's not our fault. <laughs> we are conditioned to understand that if we say the wrong thing, it doesn't just ruin that moment. It ruins a whole period of time. I'll prove it to you. So I live in California. I live in the Bay Area. If you're familiar with California, I live, I live right across from San Francisco. I live about a half hour from San Francisco. Monterey, California, that's like golf mecca. Okay, that's... I had a golf trip planned with my uncle and two cousins. This trip was planned for a month. I didn't let my wife know until early that morning when I snuck out of bed, washed up as quietly as I could. I put on my golf clothes and I kissed her on the forehead, said, okay, I'm leaving now. She goes, oh, where are you going? I said, golfing. She goes, oh, have fun. Where are you golfing today? I said, Monterey, Monterey happens to be one of her favorite places on earth. She goes, wow, you're going to Monterey and you didn't tell me. I said, yeah, well, she goes, when'd you plan this? Now I'm like a little boy in trouble, you know. <laughs> you know I'm starting to pay. <laughs> I said, uh, planned this a month ago. And that really woke her up. What? You planned this a month ago and you're barely letting me know now? I said, why have you mad for a month? <laughs> <laughs> she didn't let me go that day she, she, she kept my clubs <laughs> ladies never forget that man you're in love with is nothing but a big boy don't kill the boy in your man okay you ever see an old man that doesn't laugh he doesn't smile anymore 
That's because his wife choked the little boy out of him. <laughs> I'll prove it to you. Watch. Ladies, look around. Watch this. How many men still play some type of video game, whether it's on your phone or on the computer or on PlayStation? How many men still play games? Look around. How many men still enjoy a bowl of cereal? What, late at night, like a nighttime bowl of cereal? Bro in the back, what's your favorite cereal? Fruit Loops. Fruit Loops, okay. We're gonna pray for diabetes in a little while, all right? We're gonna... <laughs> he's, eating a, he's eating Fruit Loops at night and wonder why his legs are twitching. <laughs> How come I can't sleep? What's your favorite cereal? Uh, frosted meals. Frosted meals, okay. You don't only want to be regular, you want to be constant, huh? <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite cereal, bro? Uh, You come sit in the front row right over here by the, we're putting you by the slow section. <laughs> Pastor, what's your cereal? What's your go-to cereal? Frosted Flakes, okay. My go-to cereal is life. I eat life almost every day that I'm home. I eat original life in the morning, and then when I want that bowl of cereal at night, cinnamon life. Add a little spice. And I eat life all the time because I'm always traveling. And if something happens to me while I'm traveling, I want everybody to be able to go, he was so full of life. <laughs> That's the worst dad joke I've written in 30 years. <laughs> I got, can I share a new joke with you guys? Yeah. What time do we, because, okay, 7.30, what time can we go to? Me either. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the hotel is beautiful that, uh, that you guys got me. Um, there was, there was a, a roach in the room. <laughs> 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 I, you know, I, I've been to Hawaii plenty of times, and uh, I grew up poor, and we grew up with roaches, you know, so I, I, didn't, I didn't get scared. I grabbed it with a piece of tissue, and I threw it in the toilet, and I flushed the toilet. A little while later, I came back into the bathroom. That, to that little roach was on the seat. <laughs> he was like, Hilo strong. <laughs> 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 Okay, this is a new joke. I've only done it like two or three times, and I, I don't have it all memorized. Um, <laughs> so, because it's a long one, so I got I got to read parts of it. Because uh, I, I have I have a crazy imagination. You know, that's that's how God God wired you. Don't trip off how you're wired. Okay, whatever you are, God equipped us all differently. Okay, you know, if you're if you're a quiet type of person that likes just to you know. To just to meditate and think, that's, that's how God programmed you. If, you know, if you like going to the zoo and you like doing hyena impressions, like our brother, that's, um, <laughs> that's, that's how the Lord wired him. <laughs> okay. I love, no, I'll, I'll, I'll do that in a little bit. I, I love laughing, you know, the lockdown was horrific. We were doing shows online sitting in front of the computer and, and just and, and staring at the computer into people's screens. You know, you don't get the feedback like you get in a live event. But I developed some pet peeves um, while, while I was online. I, I, I'm too old to be on social media all the time, but I have to do it because of my job. But I developed some pet peeves during the pandemic um, on, online. And my number one pet peeve is when people use the status Am I the only one? 
You see people use that one, you know, am I the, and they'll have something dumb behind it. Am I the only one that thinks Maui's better than, you know, they'll have, they'll have compare it to something. Am I the only one that thinks hot dogs are better than burritos? I don't care what you think. There are 8 billion people on earth now. You're not the only one, okay? <laughs> If you feel sorry for albinos because they're white without the privilege and black without the cool, you're not the only one. <laughs> if you think Chuck E. Cheese is a gateway to gambling problems, you're not the only one. <laughs> if you got your family portraits at Chuck E. Cheese, you're not the only one. <laughs> Put them in a frame from Dollar Store. I was so proud of those pictures. A buck 25 for that family portrait. <laughs> if you noticed that Barbara Bush and the Quaker Oatman were never at the same party, <laughs> you're not the only one. Okay, Google that. Look up Barbara Bush <laughs> and the Quaker Oatman. If you thought an aphrodisiac was a hair care product, <laughs> you're not the only one. <laughs> okay, I'll leave those alone. <laughs> but being back and performing live is a blessing. I had three near death scares. I'm gonna show, I'm gonna share two of them with you guys. Um, I had three, uh, three near death scares. Two of them I'm gonna share tonight. I'm, a, I'm, I'm glad to be alive. The first, the first one was I thought I had a heart attack. It was gas. <laughs> Anybody ever have gas caught in the upper part of the ribs? And it'll, every time you take a breath, it feels like your, your, your chest hurts and you can't breathe. So I told my wife, I was like, babe, every time I take a breath, it hurts. She's like, let's go. She didn't even call 911. She drove me to the ER and we're flying through the streets of Richmond, California and it's the hood, right? And she's running red lights like she's an ambulance driver. We don't have a siren. And I'm like, I'm gonna die before I get there. <laughs> so I try to relax and I start playing with my phone. I had a brand new iPhone at the time and my text notification was bamboo. Anybody familiar with bamboo on your text notification? It sounds like this. That's what it sounds like, bamboo which is really frustrating if you're in public and somebody smacks your lips because you grab your phone thinking you have a message and there's nothing there. Especially if you go like to Buffalo Wild Wings or someplace like that where everybody's smacking their lips. Like last night, we were all eating ribs. I kept looking at my phone. Am I getting them? <laughs> I love Jesus. I don't like churchy, churchy people. You know, I like people that love the Lord and want to win others for the kingdom of God. But people that are just real churchy, churchy, and they don't do the community any good, they get on my nerves. But I did something very churchy. I switched from bamboo to trumpets. <laughs> it's called Sherwood Forest, and it's boo boo. So we get to the ER, they don't let my wife in because of COVID, but as soon as I said chest pains, I can't take a deep breath without it hurting, boom, front of the line, they put me in a gurney, and they wheel me into the ER, and they wire me, and they could see I was really nervous, so they gave me a little something to help me relax, and I'm falling asleep in the ER, thinking I'm having a heart attack, and after about an hour or two, my wife sends a text to check on me. <laughs> so I'm half asleep, thinking I'm having a heart attack, and I hear burr, burr. I was like, oh no, I didn't make it. <laughs> and I opened my eyes, there's two Filipino nurses there, and I said, heaven is in Manila. <laughs> Where my Filipino brothers and sisters at? Oh, ate, como esta? I'm international. Filipino with the organic cereal? You're not real Filipino. Okay. <laughs> All the other Filipinos went, all right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> uh, any, any Filipino brothers and sisters speak Tagalog? That's a beautiful language. Anybody speak Tagalog? 
It's it's beautiful. A little bit. It's a mixture of uh, Spanish and and chicken. It's a bit. <laughs> Especially if you have a potluck and the brothers and sisters, they want to share. They're very proud of their culture and they, they share the food. Oh, masa rapa dobo, bak, bak, bak. <laughs> did you cluck or did the chicken cluck? <laughs> so I'm laying there in the ER and the two nurses are talking. And the, the younger nurse was from the States. She was born in California. The older nurse had that beautiful Filipino accent. She had come from the Philippines. And I could hear them talking. And I'm a little bit drowsy. And the younger nurse said, the doctor wants to admit him. And the older nurse said, yes, to the carjack unit. <laughs> I was like, ma'am, I did not get carjacked. <laughs> I came in with chest pains. I did not get carjacked. She's like, shh, you're going to the carjack unit. <laughs> we go up the elevator. And I get off and I see the sign, cardiac unit. I was like, oh, I'm going to the cardiac unit. I thought, man, I really live in the hood. They got a unit just for carjack victims. <laughs> Well, they go transfer me from the ER bed to the bed for the night, and they had to redo the wires. And when she put, you know, the one they put on your finger for the oxygen sensor, I, I'm 100% I'm, I'm man. And every man in here at one point in his life has experienced the pull my finger trick. <laughs> if, you, if you've never done the pull my finger trick, wave a hand. Not a man could wave, not even the pastor could wave his hand. <laughs> she put the sensor on my finger and I felt like she was checking my manhood because she squeezed a little extra tight and she pulled. And I was like, is she calling me out? <laughs> so I felt obligated <laughs> to let one go. And I was like, oh, the pain is gone. She was like, oh, you're nasty. Go home. <laughs> that was death scare number one. <laughs> death scare number two is a little more personal. Um, I'm not making fun of cancer. Uh, God has been good to us. My wife has been delivered from cancer five times, okay? So I'm not mocking cancer, okay? But how many men know that we can get breast cancer? We can't. I didn't know. I'm in the shower, I'm scrubbing down, and I notice a lump on the right side of my chest. And I get out the shower and I go, babe, I got a lump on the right side of my chest. And she examines me, she's been through breast cancer, so she examines me and she goes, you have a lump on the right side of your chest. I said, I know, that's why I said I have a lump. <laughs> You should call the doctor. So I, I have TRICARE, and they try to care. Um, <laughs> that's for the vet veterans. <laughs> the doctor gets me in the next day, and the doctor examines me, and he goes, you have a lump on the right side of your chest. I said, you talked to my wife, didn't you? <laughs> he orders a special x-ray. Now, if I lived to be 100, I would bet every dollar I ever made in my life that I would never go through this next ordeal. Because all of a sudden, I'm in the mammogram department. <laughs> mammogram. I have a lot of respect for women, never more than now. Because that exam is painful, no matter what size you are. I'm, I'm an A cup, I found out. Um, <laughs> I always thought my personality was perky. I didn't know I was perky. <laughs> we get the results back a couple of days later. And I'll never forget the doctor's office calls and says, the doctor needs to see you today. He has good news and bad news. Bring your blood pressure medicine. And I'm thinking, man, the news is so bad. He's going to make me take an extra blood pressure pill. <laughs> so we get there. My wife and I are sitting there, and he goes, good news and bad news. The good news, 
you're not developing breast cancer. The bad news, you're developing a breast. <laughs> Singular, not even a pair, just one. Which really freaked out my wife because she has OCD and everything needs to match, you know. <laughs> so I said, how at this point in my life if I'm developing one? He goes, your blood pressure medicine. One in a million men will have a bad reaction and cause male breast growth. You're it. I said, my wife has my medicines. Give me, the, give me the bottle. Give me, and I read the warning label. It says upset stomach, dizziness, headache. Nowhere on here does it say, and you might grow a chichi. <laughs> that should be the first warning in my book, by the way. The best part of this true story is his treatment plan. He goes, so you can keep taking it. I don't know what school he graduated from that made him think bobblehead bedside manner was comforting. But at this point in my life, that was threatening. I felt like he wanted to motorboat me just... Pastor, I'm sharing my testimony, and they're laughing at me. <laughs> or you could stop. If you stop, it'll go away. So, of course, I stopped, and it went away. And I miss her. <laughs> okay, so this, this is my newest, my newest bit, and... Uh, I'm going to try it on you guys because I think it's, I think it's funny. Um, <laughs> I pray, Lord, give me clean jokes, even if they're a little bit edgy. I need new material. And I'm on a flight, and I had, I had the idea, and then it came to me on this flight. Because, I, you know, um, we're gonna, some people limit heaven to being, oh, we're going to be around the throne of God and worshiping. And we're going to do that. But Jesus describes a city when he describes heaven. So I, I think heaven's going to be amazing. I, I can't wait. Okay, Lord, I could wait. You know, if you, I don't want him to call me on that right now. Like, you know. I, I want to meet the people, the people from the Bible. You know, I mean, it's going to be amazing. You know, I, I want to go up to Adam. Be like, how do you like them apples? <laughs> I want to see Abel and shake his hand. You know, he's been dead the longest. You know. <laughs> Remember Cain and Abel? Abel, he was, okay, if I have to explain this, we're going to be here all night. <laughs> I want to walk up to Moses and give him a map. <laughs> see Enoch and his wife is going, where have you been? <laughs> Enoch didn't die. Okay. <laughs> I want to dance with David, you know. Uh, <laughs> no, he was a great dance. You know, he danced. He worshiped, you know. I want, at the wedding feast, I'm going to ask Lot for some salt. Hey, can you pass the salt? <laughs> <laughs> I want to see Elijah and Elisha, because I always get them mixed up. I'm going to treat them like twins. Which one are you? Elijah? Elisha? Elijah? <laughs> I want to go downtown heaven. You know, every city you go to, you know, like, we came here, and they're like, hey, we're going to go downtown. You know, I want to go to, there's going to be downtown heaven. It'll be a Chick-fil-A on every corner. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be open on Sunday. <laughs> Samson's gym, no short hair allowed. <laughs> Joseph's house of jackets. <laughs> Abraham's child care. <laughs> Jacob's wrestling school, <laughs> Noah's pet store, buy one, get one free, <laughs> Jonah's whale watching tours, <laughs> Job's employment service. <laughs> okay, I'm not the only one that thought it was Job, uh, job, <laughs> you know, when I read Job. <laughs> uh, well, let's see, I want to I see TV on heaven. 
They're going to have TV. You watch like the evening news, Noah's the weatherman. It's going to rain. <laughs> I'll see my mom and dad and be like, surprise, made it. <laughs> and then I'll see Jesus. And I'll do my best to say thank you because he's been so good to me. Um, I don't know about you, but he's blessed me in so many ways. He was patient with me. I was lost. I was lost for a long time. Um, that joke about my wife's not a joke. She was, my, she was my Sunday school sweetheart, little boy, little girl, and everybody knew we liked each other, and when we fell, it broke me. I don't know about you, uh, sometimes a life moment will break you, and I was lost for a long time, but it was uh, 20 years ago, next month is when my dad passed away, and my dad was my hero. He was a heroin addict that was saved in prison. High on heroin the last time he was arrested, because he was arrested from 11 to his early 20s, in and out of boys' camps, and then once he was 18, to prisons. And uh, the last time he got arrested, laying in a cell, high on heroin, he had, and he had just sold to an undercover agent. This is 1950s, a Mexican in California selling drugs to an undercover agent. They throw away the key. But in the prison cell, my dad looked up and said, if you're real, change me. And he was instantly delivered from heroin addiction. No 12-step program, no withdrawals, instantly set free. And he went on to preach the gospel for 40 years. And when he, when he died, it broke me. Um, I was crushed because he was my hero. But six weeks after he died, my son, the one that gets on my nerves, um, <laughs> I love him, but he's, that, that boy's just, dad doesn't know anything. And then when he messes up, oh, I'm sorry, dad, you were right. <laughs> you know, he's one of those kids. But he was born with his intestines outside of his body. And when they, they said we have to induce labor because his kidneys are failing, we knew he had a hernia. They said a hernia. But we go for a checkup, and they went, we have to admit her. Um, we have to induce labor tonight. And I walked out of the hospital. I was raised Latin American Assemblies of God. So that means I got saved every other Sunday and most Thursdays. <laughs> But I walked through the parking lot of Travis Air Force Base Hospital, and I asked Jesus back into my heart. I said, I know I have not been living right. for all the I was, I was living an entertainer's life. Even though I was active duty, I was living an entertainer's life. And I asked him to forgive me. And, but what I did first, I reached for my phone. Were, any PKs here? We're the preacher's kids. You, you ever noticed that before you prayed, you called mom and dad? You, you ever done that before? I reached for my phone to call my dad, and that's when it hit me. My hero was gone. But that's when the Holy Spirit showed up, like perfect timing, and he said, it's time for you to be the man of your own house. He's not a deal maker, but he's a promise keeper, and I made a promise back to him. I said, save my son, and I'll serve you the rest of my life. And the next morning, my son was born. His intestines were fully exposed. They clipped off his appendix because it was just in the way. They, he'll never have to have appendix surgery because um, they rushed him to Children's Hospital in Oakland, California. And by the time I got there, uh, my mom had met the ambulance on the dock. My mom was old school Pentecostal. She believed in laying on of hands. And she was right there at the dock with some, but it wasn't anointing oil. It was, it was lard. It was manteca. But she, <laughs> that's, that's all she had at home. <laughs> She prayed, she prayed over that incubator. My cousin works at the hospital, and he helped. So when they wheeled the baby out, she said, hold up. She prayed. And then by the time I got there, the doctors came out, and they said, it'll be three months that he's in an incubator. It'll be a month before he can even eat on his own. Because when you handle the human intestines, they shut down. And I'm, I'm sitting, I'm still active duty. How am I going to go an hour away from work every day? I don't have that much leave. That's all I'm thinking. But nobody knows you like your mom. And my mom looked at me. And she said, mijo, which is Spanish for my son. She said, mijo, their medical book says three months. Our book says something different. Yes. Hallelujah. One week later, my son was eating. One month later, he was home. He played football. He wrestled. He gets on my nerves. But he is 100% healthy. 
Um, and, and there, there's such a purpose on his life, he doesn't see it yet. Um, September, he had a gun put to his head. His neighbor set up, his neighbor set him up and said, are you home? He's like, yeah, I just got here. And a minute later, two thugs pulled up. They wanted to, they, he has, he lives in a trailer park with his mother, but he has a, a new Mustang. So they're like, they got money. So the kids come up to him and they start beating him and he wouldn't get out of the car and they, they broke his tooth. They busted up his, his lip. He had to get stitches. But he held on to his phone and he hit the emergency button on the phone. And when the kids saw that, they took off running. But then the kid with the gun came back to him, put the gun to his head and pulled the trigger and the gun backfired. And when he told me that, I said, son, I fall asleep every night praying for you. Pray for your children. Don't give up on your children. And I know my son has a purpose because God spared his life. Nine millimeter guns don't backfire. This gun, the bullet could not come out. But God has been so good to me. He, he, I never thought I would get my wife back. And when we had the opportunity to get back together, we eloped. People were surprised because we had nothing to do with each other for 23 years. And the opportunity came, and the key to us getting back together was forgiving each other. There was no infidelity. There was nothing like that. It was a matter of choosing to let the past go so we could have a future together. My, my big crime was I was married to the Air Force. He used to say that, you're married to the Air Force. Men, take care of your wife. I, I can only speak to men. I don't know what it's like to be a woman. But men, if you're at work seven days a week, if you're at church seven days a week, if you stop dating that girl that you couldn't wait to take out, and now you're married and you don't give her any time, brother, you're out of line. Give your, that's what she asked me for. I need some of your time. So we do our best to try to go out at least once a week. And guess what, guys? They don't want money. They don't want gifts. They want your time. Put your phone down, which I have a hard time with. Put your phone down and take them for a sandwich. And sit there and spend time with your wife. You would be amazed how happy she'll be. That, that's, just, that's just real facts. You looked at her when you saw her and went, that's the one. I wonder if she'll go out to lunch with me. I wonder if I could take her to a movie. And then you went out a couple of times and you fell in love and then you forget to date her. You got to date. Your, treat your wife like your girlfriend. And if you treat your wife like your girlfriend, you'll never lose your wife. Amen. But more importantly, put God in the middle of your marriage. When, when we're at church together, for at least one worship song, we hold hands. I don't know about you, but I've lost my love for uh, 23 years it cost me. I never want to lose that again. So if you worship, God inhabits the praises of his people. You're inviting God into the middle of whatever situation. If God is in the middle of your marriage, the enemy cannot attack your marriage. So worship with your spouse, and you'll be surprised how the Lord blesses your marriage. I fell in love with Jesus 19 years ago, and I had a rough journey. Um, being raised in the church, the senior pastor was my grandfather. The Sunday school teacher, the director was my mom. My dad was an associate pastor, then later became the senior pastor. I grew up surrounded in religion, but it wasn't until I was broken that I fell in love with Jesus. And just to know that he loves me for who I am. He sees me better than I see myself. It's so important because people get hurt. Religion will let you down. People get hurt in churches because they're looking at people instead of looking at God. God will never hurt you. God will never disappoint you. So fall in love with Jesus. Even if you go to church faithfully, I see people that go to church all the time. And they don't have a relationship with Jesus. They have a relationship with religion. And you're going to get your heart broken if you do that. But if you fall in love with him and your identity is in him. Paul wrote that 170 times. In him, in Christ, in the Lord. That should tell you how important it is for us to have our identity in Christ. If you have your identity in Christ, your situations don't shift your relationship with God. 
You understand that? Ephesians, I'm going to read one scripture, then we can go home. It's 8 o'clock, which means it's 10 o'clock where I'm at. <laughs> where are you going? Oh, oh it's pastor's wife. I'm sorry. <laughs> She's like, you're right. It's 8 o'clock. It's past my bedtime. <laughs> I had a little bit of zealot in me when I went to, when I went to Bible school. Because I would hear people say life scripture, and I was like, man, all the scriptures are good. What do you mean you got a life scripture? And then I heard this scripture, and the professor broke it down. Ephesians 4, Ephesians 4, 1, blessed be the Father. No, that's a walk worthy. As a prisoner for the Lord, walk worthy of the call. Then he broke the scripture down. I'm paraphrasing because my, my phone is spinning. It's, it's a smartphone, and I'm not that smart. <laughs> I need an ampersand. Um. <laughs> that word worthy in, in, the, in the translation that uses worthy, in the Greek, that word means weighted balance. So Paul is saying, as a prisoner of the Lord, as a child, you're, you're, you're a love prisoner. You're, you're in love with God. Walk worthy of the call. So he's saying walk with balance. You're a child of God, which means you're royalty. Act like you're a child of God. And that's easy when the marriage is perfect. You got the promotion at work. All the kids are serving the Lord. When everything in your life is perfect, it's easy to walk with your head held high. But how about when the marriage is on the rocks, when the kids aren't serving the Lord, when you got laid off from work, when you're behind on your bills, when you have health issues, can you still walk? with your head held high. That's, that's the balance Paul was, work, uh, was speaking of. So in the middle of the storm, when you're going through it and you hold your head up high, people will see that and go, look at that. She's got so many problems, yet she's able to worship God. He's going through hell right now, but he still is in love with Jesus. That's, that's the worthiness that Paul was speaking of. Walk worthy of the call. But you have to be willing to embrace your season and give it to God. This whole relationship with Jesus comes down to surrender. You can't hold on to your past and expect to step into your future. Whatever you're holding on to, that is who you are. I had a close relative. She went through a divorce in her mid-30s. Until she died in her mid-60s, she was a very hurt, broken person. Read her Bible every day. She could quote scripture after scripture better than most ministers. But she sat in that wheelchair, bitter. And even medical doctors told her, your anger is crippling you. She was a woman whose husband left her. And she died a woman whose husband had left her. She didn't die as a princess going to heaven. I believe she's in heaven, but she did not live with her head held high so that others could see Christ shining through her. She lived as, as a victim. She never surrendered that deep hurt. Who's been hurt before? Who's made some bad decisions? I always got to raise two hands. But if that is what defines you, that is who you are. And you have to be willing to surrender your past so God can use you for his glory. We trade hurts for scars. You got to think about it. In my crazy imagination, I, I was sitting in my recliner one morning and I was like, man, this love story, because the Bible, if you read it as a love story, it's the most amazing love story ever written. And I'm going, man, Lord, you did such a great job writing this. Shakespeare could not write this. And then I went, man, but what would I do different? Foolishly, but respectfully. I was like, man, if I, if I could have written something in the Bible or laid out this great love story, when Jesus goes to the cross, I would have had him jump off and go, you can't touch this. He wasn't a superhero. He was flesh and blood. And nobody 
sent him to the cross other than the call on his life. He was obedient to the call on his life. Then he jumps off. The, he, well, he, he, he defeats death. He didn't jump off the cross. He died. That's what the Bible says. And then the third day, he defeats death. And I'm thinking instead of the stone rolling away, he should have kicked it. It came out when I beat death. But that's not what the Bible says. First ones to see him, he said, don't touch me. I have to go see my father. Now, he takes the sins of the world, but he also takes the hurts. He takes anxiety. He takes depression. He takes anything that would rob us from the joy that we should have as children of the most high God. And he goes, here you go, dad. I paid the price. Every hurt that would rob you of the joy that God has for you, he put at his father's feet and said, I paid the price. Now, he appears before the disciples. I'm thinking he just saw his father. He should be perfect. He just saw the creator of the universe. He should appear perfect. That's not what the Bible says. He said, go ahead, touch me. That's where they stabbed me. There's the nail scars. He traded the hurts of the world, the sins of the world for scars. Why are you holding on to your hurts? Why are you letting something that he already bought rob you of the joy that God has for you? Let's all bow our heads. We're going to wrap. I went way too long, but we're going to wrap up here. Lord, we thank you for this night because your word says that laughter is good medicine. We thank you for an opportunity to come into the house, to your house, with our brothers and sisters. If you're here tonight with every head bowed, if you're here tonight and you have some areas of your life you want to surrender, just raise your hands right where you are. If you got some hurts, some disappointments, some bad blows, just raise your hands right where you are. Don't allow the enemy to have one more minute to rob you of the joy that, he has for, that the Lord has for you. Okay, you can put your hands down. And more importantly, if you came to a comedy show and maybe you've strayed away from your relationship with God or you've never asked Jesus into your heart, Jesus is inviting you into a relationship. And if you want to get your relationship with God right tonight, just raise your hand. We would love to pray you into the kingdom. Right where you are, just raise your hand if you want a relationship with God. See, uh, uh, it's not the prayer, it's the act of faith. You said, yes, I want a relationship. And the Bible says a celebration breaks out in heaven every time someone raises their hand and says, yes, I want a relationship. Let's all stand. Father, you've seen the honest hands and the honest hearts. Tonight, Lord, we surrender these hurts. We surrender everything that would rob us in, from a relationship with you, Lord, from the joy that you have from us. We are no longer tied to the past. We step into your blessings, Father, by giving up these hurts, and we surrender them tonight. We trade these hurts for scars, Lord, that we can use them for your glory. And we're going to say this prayer together. I saw a handful of hands go up. If you raised your hand, say this prayer and mean it in your heart, and your name is written in the book of life. Let's all say this together as corporately as a church. Dear Jesus, I want a relationship with you. I accept your invitation to do life with you. Tonight, Jesus, I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to give me a new start. I believe you are the son of God. I believe you rose on the third day. And tonight, Jesus, I declare you Lord. I will follow you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Give the Lord a round of applause. Tomorrow, in, invite a friend, what, 9 and 11? Two services tomorrow, as you, you guys know if you attend here, but invite a friend. Uh, I, don't, I think I used all my jokes, <laughs> but uh, I, I still have more to share with you, but uh, sharing a, a word that the Lord has been using. Um, 
the sermon, uh, the altar call lasts longer than the sermon. Every time I've shared this word, the Lord has used it in a mighty way. And I'm believing tomorrow um, for a great move of the Holy Spirit right here in the house. Okay. God bless you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Amen. Let's give, let's give Dennis another hand here. Thank you, brother. Listen, if you, uh, if you have a church you attend, we want you to attend your church. Uh, if you don't have a church to attend, we want you to attend here. Uh, and so, uh, I'm not trying to take you out of your church, but we're glad that you're, you're with us tonight. Um, we, we're not charging for this. If anybody, if they feel compelled to leave a love offering, there's a little box in the back. You can put that in there. Uh, this wasn't about money. This was about an outreach for our city. Um, I've already talked with Dennis uh, about coming. At, he's going to be back in, on the Big Island in August, and uh, we'd like to uh, maybe do something more citywide. And so you guys have heard what, uh, you know, you've heard all of his jokes. He doesn't have anything more, but uh, uh, maybe, maybe by August he might come up with one or two more. And so we'd, we're, glad, we're glad that you came tonight. And... Uh, I just want to close in prayer. Father, thank you, uh, Lord, for what you're doing. We thank you for what you're doing in, uh, in Dennis's life and Lorna's life and their family. We ask that you would just continue, Lord, to use them, Father, and that the anointing of the Holy Spirit, Lord, would be released through their life. We pray, Father, for, uh, Lord, what you want to do on this island, Father, and we ask, God, that we would see more people come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Lord, that revival, Lord, that we believe is going to start uh, from Hawaii, God, we ask, Lord, that you would send it, Father. And Lord, help us to be part of that. We ask that in Jesus' name. Lord, as we leave here tonight, we ask that you would go with us, Lord, and uh, bring us back to our, to our places where we need to be tomorrow. And uh, we just pray a blessing upon every home that's represented here tonight. We ask those things tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming. God bless.